Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. Hey there, everyone. Kevin Cruz here. Welcome to another edition of the LeadX Leadership Show. I am so grateful that you've joined me again. You're giving me your most valuable asset, which is your time. And of course, this is a Friday edition of the LeadX Leadership Show, which means it's Fan Mail Friday. We take questions from our listeners and I get to rant about whatever I want to talk about. In just a minute, we're going to be hearing from Jack, who wants some good advice about his first few weeks on his new job as a manager. We're going to be getting a question from Miro, the jeweler, and Lori's boss thinks they do too many surveys, doesn't want to send out an engagement survey, and Jay wants to know how to blast out of depression and get motivated. But first, one big thing, and you're probably too late, but if you're listening to this episode on the day it's released, which is June 1st of 2018. Today is literally the last day you can get an annual subscription to LeadX Academy online at leadx.org for only $7 a month when you subscribe annually. It literally more than triples tomorrow. I think it goes to $22.50 a month on average if you subscribe annually starting tomorrow. So today is the day you get to sign up today for three days for free just to check out the program. And of course, if you don't know what the LeadX Academy is by now, really quickly, it's got the Big Five Personality Assessment for Self-Awareness. It has over 200 micro lessons on productivity and leadership. It's got an experimental chatbot. It's got tools and we're adding more all of the time. I just got an email from Margaret Crowley. She's been a member a while. She was nice enough to send me this note. She says, I'm not sure how people don't know what LeadX is. It kind of baffles me. You have no idea how much of an impact it makes on my overall effectiveness as a new supervisor. You are making a difference every day. Smiley face. Awesome, Margaret. Thank you. Glad you're finding so much value. And this next one about the LeadX Academy, you're going to think I made it up, but it comes from Madeline Murray, who's talking about the productivity benefits from all the productivity training in the Academy. She says, I work in a busy middle management role, managing multiple projects, working towards constant deadlines. I've struggled with my to-do list, with prioritizing and planning, which results in stress, carries over into my home life, affects my husband and children. Not anymore. Since engaging in some of the continuing professional development in LeadX, I developed a system which has transformed my life. MITs, she's referring to the concept of most important tasks. I'm ahead of schedule on a number of projects. I'm factoring in time for walks and family and eating healthy, despite the fact that this is a very busy season. Anyway, wanted to share share that with you as a subscription to LeadX is the best value for continuing professional development I've ever engaged in. I would recommend it without hesitation to anyone in a leadership role or aspiring to be a leader. So again, today's the day. Just you know, go online, three days for you to check it out and then keep it or say, hey, not for me and we will unsubscribe you. Okay, let's dive right into our first question from Jack who says, just want to say I'm a massive fan of your podcast, really insightful. I find myself constantly jotting down things to bring into my daily habits. So thanks for that. Then he continues, I'm just about ready to start a new role. I could use some advice. It's a step up for me and my first official director level role. I'll be a BD director at a growing ad agency. I've been doing sales for around 13 years, but now as an official senior management position, it's new. It's going to come with challenges, not least of which I'll have a direct report. So not sure what exactly I'm asking other than what's some good advice for my first few weeks in the job? How do I make a great impression and start off on the right foot? Cheers, Jack. Jack's question is a setup for me to plug the LeadX Academy because our very first course in Manager Fundamentals is moving from individual contributor to first time manager. And Jack, in there, we talk about your first 90 days. And the short version is you need to think about your direct report. You have one. Other people have more. Your team your boss, the person quote unquote above you, and then yourself. And so in terms of getting off to a strong start, 
the first few weeks and months, it's critical that you build a relationship with that direct report. So get in that habit of one-on-one -on -one weekly meetings where primarily you are listening. You are using that time to build your relationship and to make a connection. You're using that time to begin creating a team culture of feedback, which includes positive feedback. And in fact, for like your whole first month, only ask for feedback your second month, you want to give positive feedback, and it's only in your third month that you probably want to start giving some constructive feedback using the BIG model, the, the behavior impact get agreement model for feedback. Now, I'm not sure if you also have a new boss, the person you're reporting to, uh, Jack, but if you do, then this time is also critical for just similar, have these meetings, ask for a meeting or use some time in one of your, your weekly meetings with your supervisor and just make sure you are crystal clear. What are the goals and objectives? What does an amazing year look like for your boss? What does an amazing quarter look like for your boss? And very critically, how does your boss like to be kept in the loop? Does she want to be updated every day what you're doing once a week, once a month? Uh, does he want to hear from you in an email, a phone call, a text message? Does he like um, to be contacted after hours and on the weekend or never? And this is where you start to think about personality styles. And this is, uh, again, we've got, we use the lead, the lead X big five personality model, but what is your natural style and start to look for clues about the style of your supervisor and keep that in mind. Just as an example, you know, on the openness trait, Jack, if you're high in openness, uh, well, let me use a different one, even something that people can relate to more commonly, extroversion versus introversion. If you're in business development, you might be a big extrovert, uh, but if your supervisor is a big introvert, you just need to keep that in mind and realize that, you know, he's not ignoring you when he keeps the door closed in the afternoon. He's recharging and getting some work done. You need to make sure you're not overwhelming him, you know, with the social stuff or uh, excessive chatter when uh, your boss, if he or she is an introvert, you know, might need more analytical time. So that's just a start. And then finally, don't forget to take care of yourself. Lots of stress comes with this new role. So set up your own support systems, your habits for health, your habits for de-stressing, even if that's taking a walk at lunchtime or meditating in the morning. And who's your support network going to be? Will it be other managers in your company, on your team? Will it be other managers outside of your team? But someone that you can go to for advice or just to bounce ideas off of them. So good luck, Jack, and thanks for that question. And here's another one. This one comes from Lori. She says, I work for a mining company. We've done annual engagement surveys in 2016, 2017. We should have done one two months ago, but it keeps getting pushed off because our general manager thinks we do too many surveys. I think a real concern is that she doesn't want to get negative feedback. In the past, we've scored reasonably well, averaging 3.8 out of five with about a 75% response rate. Scores from 2017 were slightly lower. I had hoped to do your quick seven question survey at the six month mark. She's referring to the seven questions that I lay out in Employee Engagement 2.0, a very short, actionable book for managers you can get online. Um, she says, we never did it though, because same reason, GM thinks we're doing too many surveys. Now, my boss, not the general manager, wants me to put together a document stating what we've done to improve employee engagement as a result of the survey. I believe this document is intended to prevent employees from saying we haven't done anything. What are your thoughts on handling this situation, Lori? Lori, thanks for the question. You're in a tough situation. Look, it's hard to change anybody. It's hard to change people above you, meaning your boss, and it's really hard to change people two levels above you. Uh, some random thoughts on what you shared. The fact that you're doing the engagement survey once a year is great and certainly is not over surveying. And one of the things that I can see is if you're getting a 75% response rate, that's still a very good response rate. For large companies, I don't know how many people are in your company, but for large companies, a 50% response rate is not unusual to see. I think 75% is good and you know you're in a very highly engaged 
a best practice culture when you get 90% results from a large group. So, I mean, you know, just from the data, I would say you're not surveying too much if you're still getting a 75% response rate. Also, the other surveys you may be doing, if you're going to cut something, it's probably one of them, meaning the engagement survey is a bedrock survey. So if you're doing a survey about safety, yes, safety is important, but engagement is a driver of better safety results. So you shouldn't throw that out. That's like the precursor to awareness and better safety. And I, and I know I'm preaching to the choir on this. Now, having said all that, I uh, keynoted an IBM uh, conference on talent about a year and a half ago, and then they invited me to facilitate their customer advisory board for their talent management group. So I was in the conference room with the heads of HR of you know some of the most big and well-known companies in the world, and a common theme in that meeting was they all felt that their their employees were getting hit with too many surveys and the surveys were too long. So a lot of that conversation was about, and I think it's a little bit of a fad right now, uh, to be honest, is how do we do you know shorter pulse surveys or give everybody a survey once a week, but it's only three questions. You just need to make sure if you're going to go that route that you're still using validated questions and you know you know what you're doing uh, from from that uh, psychometric standpoint. But anyway, if it was me, I would lay out a new idea or approach, you know, sort of throw management a bone on a streamlined approach to surveys. And I would say the engagement survey is the bedrock. That's your annual anchor survey. You're using a 50-ish question survey, uh, you know, not mine. Uh, you might recommend doing a smaller one using the core seven questions or some other core Gallup 12 or whatever you want to use. The other thing is you could always at the end of the engagement survey, the shorter engagement survey, then tack on some of the other survey questions. So you're hitting everybody once on multiple topics. The other thing is just to get into a cadence. You know, one cadence I like is to run you know, most CEOs, most general managers run their companies on quarters because that's what their investors want. So to say, look, we are going to create a culture of quarterly feedback. We are going to train the employee base to know that once a quarter we want your feedback and once a year it's going to be on engagement. Once a year, it's going to be on safety. Once a year, it's going to be on whatever. And the fourth one's going to be miscellaneous. And say that and you know, 75% response rate is good, is fine. So as long as you're not dipping you know, below 50%, this strategy should be fine. Related to what you guys are doing, you know, that report, I, you know, I'm not a mind reader. I don't know why your, your boss is truly asking for that. But lay out what you guys have done and lay out what still remains to be done. But it, this document gives you a chance to push the philosophy that engagement needs to change at a grassroots level. It's not what you have done. It's what the managers are doing. So if you're surveying, giving the results to your managers, helping your managers to implement an action plan, holding the managers accountable for sharing the data and doing the action planning and the follow up, you're doing what you need to do. The question is, how many of your managers have done the action plan step? That would be the data I would want to see as your general manager. I'm going to hit another couple of questions in a second. I guess for my weekly rant, my weekly uh, back office discussion, for those of you who are interested in you know, how I'm building this SaaS company, you know, one thing I thought of over the weekend, it was Memorial Day weekend here in the States, uh, which is normally a long weekend of relaxation and barbecuing, grilling, things like that. And I was working my butt off and, and solving problems. And, uh, you know, it's this uh, I was thinking about this Instagram version of things. And usually, well, first of all, I'm not that big on, on Instagram uh, or social media. But I'm also guilty of, you know, the Instagram social media version of our lives, of our careers is the highlight reel. It's the edited highlight reel. And if you look at these entre so-called entrepreneurs online, you know, most of them and most of them are like, you know, cryptocurrencies or uh, real estate or be an Internet consultant. You know, they're kind of they're not like uh, hardcore traditional business people. It's kind of like, how do you make a lot of money as a young person approach, which is fine. Not for me, but it's fine. But like 
their their Instagram feed is about, oh, you know, I work two hours a day and then I just drive my Ferrari uh, filled with beautiful women and a uh, uh, champagne in my hand, you know, and that's their version of, of entrepreneurship, which of course looks appealing to a lot of people. Uh, and then you send them a thousand dollars and they send you like a video of how to, how to do it or something like that. And I was thinking that, you know, even in my own, I'm kind of guilty of this, you know, in my own Instagram feed, social media feed, like if you looked in the last week, you know, there's pictures of me like at this uh, Philadelphia uh, Chinese Lantern Festival with all these cool things. There's pictures of me eating at, you know, some four star restaurants in Philadelphia. Uh, I generally don't take pictures of my cars, but, you know, there could be me in some nice cars. Uh, you often see me traveling, you know, I'm, this week. Uh, by the time you listen to this, I will have come back from a resort off the coast of Georgia. You know, so I'm flying every other week to like a really nice hotel, Four Seasons, Ritz Carlton's, blah, blah, blah. Right. So that's the edited highlight reel. The reality, which really, I guess only the podcast listeners know, but maybe I need to share more of this, is that the startup life is a grind. Now, I'm the guy that is the most productive man in the world, right? You know, so I, a single dad, entrepreneur, I am productive. I know how I do it, but there are still moments. And in that first year, that first two years of doing a real startup, I mean, there's never enough time. Things are always breaking because you're building and growing so fast. And in the last week, <laughs> we've, we were getting ready to publicly launch the iOS app, the enterprise app of the LeadX Academy. And so there's all these development sprints and bugs and problems that, you know, we're, we're ironing out. And, you know, I'm involved in those because we're such a small company. We're launching, you know, we're closing down this last week of special pre-launch pricing. So we're getting a flood of new customers. That's the good news. When you get a flood of new customers, you get all these support questions about where's my password and all of those things. And, and you know, we're dealing with those issues. We're implementing, you know, new software and systems and trying to hire a CTO and all of this stuff. And so, um, yeah. <laughs> People could look at Instagram and entrepreneurship and my life looks like, whoa, that's really cool. And yet probably while all of you were grilling, I was in my little office uh, replying to customers and wannabe customers and slinging things are broken emails to my CTO and all the rest. Um, we're literally going to a trade show next week. And like the giant booth from China arrives and doesn't assemble right. And <laughs> what are we going to do about that? The software we're going to demo in the booth isn't actually done yet. <laughs> what are we going to do about that? We're a week away. And, you know, this is this is the busiest. We're right before launch. So this is the busiest, craziest we've been in a year and a half. And I go back to, you know, let me tie this back to leadership. You know, as I've gotten older, I've gotten more stoic by nature anyway. But trust me, I am feeling the stress. And, you know, I'm not sleeping a whole lot and I'm back to not working out a whole lot and my body's feeling it. You know, this I'm I'm I can't bend the 1440 minutes in a day. There's just reality at times like this. And yet I try to uh, be authentic. You know, I'm not hiding these problems from the team. I'm not burying them. I'm not uh, in any way hiding reality. And yet what I've learned from, you know, a couple Navy SEAL friends is I don't share the emotional <laughs> anguish and fear, the illogical stuff that's inside of me because emotions are contagious. So that's the part that I don't share with the team. And they know, they can tell uh, that things have changed because I'll get more directive. You know, I'll cancel for the first time in six months some one on one meetings because we need the time to work the problem. And that's the best way I view it, you know, right? So we can't control everything. We can't control the things that happen to us. We can control how we react. And I think about, you know, the, the Apollo 13 mission and the movie and, Houston, we have a problem. I mean, yeah, we can't get home and we might die. And it's just this flat Houston, we have a problem. And that's what I would encourage everybody to do. That's what I try to do in these times of crisis. Freaking out, throwing a tantrum, becoming a screamer, uh, yelling at people doesn't help to solve the problem. And so 
and I know that. So I feel the stress and I try to deal with the stress by trying to get sleep and eat right and move and all that. Not always really successful, but with the team, it's like, okay, yes, I'm going to be more directive. They might hear me curse a little bit more, not at anyone, but in the moment I might, I might, you know, go into cursing mode for a minute. They know that things are need to get fixed thing. Everybody needs to get focused, but that's all we do. We go into brainstorming mode. Okay. How are we going to fix this broken booth from China? Let's brainstorm those ideas. Okay. Let's start with a plan B. Let's assume we can't get this booth working right. How can we quickly come up with something, you know, uh, as a backup plan, rent a booth, get a booth, get somebody on that, you know, so you just start working the problem. And I try to, that's sort of a mantra when things personal life, when, uh, my dishwasher's flooding my kitchen and all my hardwood just warped. Yep. That's going on too in my life, everything else. Yeah. You know, in the moment I start to get triggered, I start to get reactive and as quickly as I can deep breath, count to five, let's work the problem. So let's change it up a little bit with our last two questions. I got a question from Miro the Jeweler who says, uh, my challenge, it's maybe not in your area. It's about leaving my job, starting my own business. It's my biggest struggle. I don't have a clear plan in mind whether to do it online or to have a physical shop. I'm in fine jewelry, by the way. Should I do it in England or in France? I'm so confused. I know once I have a clear plan, I will work hard to achieve my goals. I would like advice on uh, this situation. Miro, the jeweler. So, okay, so (laughs) I'm not a jeweler. Uh, I don't know anything about the jewelry business, but that's okay. So this is basically an entrepreneurship question I get all the time, which is, I know I'm going to be successful, but I need the plan. And what should I do? Should I invest in real estate? Should I invest in cryptocurrency? Should I become a dog walker? Should I go into consulting? Should I do uh, a solo consulting practice? And, or should I build a big business? Should I start a software company that does customer service software? Or should I do a software company that does X, Y, and Z? And it's amazing because a lot of my close friends will come to me and say, Kevin, I've got to, I haven't seen you in 10 years. They're still a close friend, but I've got to take you out to lunch because you're, you're going to love this idea for a business and I want to run it by you. And they tell me their idea and they love it and they think it's genius or they have two ideas and they're trying to decide and they, they're looking for me to say, yeah, it's a good idea or it's a good idea, but you need to do these two things. My answer is always the same. I have no idea. And on all of my own ideas, including LeadX, I need to take, go with an I don't know mindset. The, the companies I've had where I've lost the most money, like half a million dollars in a year kind of money, it's when I was sure I had a great idea. I was so sure, I didn't ask the marketplace. I didn't ask any potential buyers <laughs> until it was too late. So my advice, Miro, is nobody knows Instead of picking the plan and writing the plan, it's experimenting. You want to try a minimum viable product, an MVP, whether you've got a service or an actual product. So it means, you know, um, you're thinking about online. That's the easiest one to, to try. Take three pieces of jewelry and put up the online store and uh, put it in English and see if it works. And if you're not selling anything, maybe uh, put it in French and see if you're selling to people in France. Or if you're living in one of those places, instead of committing to one year's worth of rent at a mall to set up a jewelry store, go to a local you know flea market or put up a stand or rent a desk at an established jewelry store do something small to start gathering the data and leadx is no different like i've got uh, a vision i've got a mission but those are the the overarching principles how we're going to get there will change and it's what i thought we were going to be offering a year and a half from now you know, the idea of personality aware, uh, personality assessment and self-awareness wasn't on my radar. And that came from feedback from customers and it came from feedback from executive coaches. This whole idea of an artificially intelligent executive coach wasn't on my, on my radar when we started a year and a half ago. As you listeners know, I'm fascinated by AI and didn't quite understand how to apply it into this space. And we will continue to always just experiment, 
listen to the market, experiment, listen to the market. To me, the real question for any want to be entrepreneur is not what are you going to do or how are you going to do it? The big question is, who do you want to serve? Who do you want to serve? Because that starts your niche. Uh, if you are a fitness coach, you know, a fitness instructor, a personal trainer, do you want to serve uh, teen, ath teen athletes in high school or middle school to help them to develop and be better at sports and to learn discipline and goal setting? Or do you want to be a fitness uh, coach? Do you want to be a personal trainer for uh, people who have just had a baby or for people who are retired over age 65 or whatever? Who do you want to serve is the bigger question. And then later, there could be multiple ways that you serve them. So that's a little bit of a different advice for entrepreneurship. Lastly, before I sign off, Joey says, what would you say to someone who at times had been efficient, later had slipped into deep depression after having surgery? Cannot seem to find any motivation or passion towards anything. How do I create a routine or structured behavior? So listen, Joey, uh, thanks for the question. Sorry for your troubles. When you talk about deep depression, first, I got to say, look, I am not a doctor and it sounds like depression after having surgery. Anyone out there who is really depressed and deep depression, like you've got to go talk to your doctor about this. Uh, it's not something to mess with. People struggle with depression and carry it or bury it over life. And thankfully, so many more people, including strong men and athletes and others, are saying they're struggling with depression or anxiety. Uh, you know, make sure you're talking to a professional. You know, just off the top of my head, you know, is it some medications, post surgery medications that you're on? Are you still in pain? Pain is a comorbidity often with depression. Is it a lack of sleep? Again, pain or surgery that's causing this. Lots of potential things going, or it could just be unrelated depression that may or may not, you know, respond to meds, et cetera, but take it seriously. Having said all that in my own, I'm not giving advice. I'm just sharing my own experience, uh, you know, that I have found and the research shows that daily 20 minute cardio, you know, it's a fast walk on the treadmill can be as effective for many people as uh, medications when it comes to mood and depression. You know, I think environment is the number one thing. So when it comes to what is the environment for our mind, for our mood, it's our body. So it's getting deep sleep. It's drinking lots of water. It's eating a slow carb, no carb type diet. So you're avoiding the sugar crashes. It's minimizing, you know, drugs and, and alcohols. So anything that's going to be messing with your moods, uh, maybe in ways you don't realize, you've got to clean up that environment. And then again, the daily 20 minutes, preferably outside walking is great. You got to get outside, got to move, all the rest. When I get really dark and stress, I do two other things. The main thing I do is I, I believe in an attitude of gratitude. So I have a daily gratitude practice where I think, you know, of three new things every morning that I'm grateful for. But when I get deep and dark or stressed, man, I'll pull the freaking car over and I'll go into gratitude for 20 minutes uh, to try to bounce back out of that. Uh, so take care of your body and move. Go into a practice of gratitude. And if you want a third, it's go out and help others. Man, I tend to be in a pretty good mood the week after I've gone and volunteered at a homeless shelter. Um, that's what works for me. Uh, Joey, good luck and, uh, and be well. Hey, everybody, I am going to sign out. We went long today. I thought this was going to be short. Again, you can read me on Forbes.com or at LeadX.org. Uh, on Instagram, I'm at Kevin Author. On Twitter, I'm at Cruz. On my Facebook page, I am Cruz Author. Connect with me on social media or send me your questions. Send me your comments. Send me your feedback. I'm at Kevin at LeadX.org. Don't forget, today's the last day. You can sign up for the one third the price of LeadX Academy. Just try it for three days. If it's not for you, hey, I ain't going to be offended. No big deal. Have a great weekend. I hope you have an amazing weekend. And remember, of course, leadership isn't a choice because leadership is influence. How are you going to influence those around you? Are you going to do it mindfully or not? How are you going to lead today? 